A Curse of Gems, a clean fantasy fairy tale retelling of Toads and Diamonds, Part 3. By Brittany Fichter. Book Copyright 2019. Audio Copyright 2023. Chapter 16. Dead of Night. Jell didn't mean to fall asleep, but the moment her eyes flew open, she knew she must have slipped into a slumber sometime after telling the prince about the holy man. Why had she told him that? And what was it that had awakened her now? She blinked into the darkness. The moonlight was about as bright as it got in Terra Phantom. Not blinding, the way her father had once said moonlight could be in other kingdoms, but it was bright enough, its light pushing through the clouds enough that one could see the world outside through the window. The fire had weakened to merely burning embers. Dina was still snoring quietly beside her. When she looked at Lucas, however, she realized that something must have really awakened her, for though he was lying on his bed, he was facing their host's door behind her, and his eyes were wide open. His body was rigid, tightly wound and ready to spring. Then Jell heard the shuffling of feet. As she watched, the figure of their hostess made its way across the room. Jell glanced at Lucas again, who gave her the subtlest of head shakes. So she remained perfectly still. She wanted nothing more, though, than to leap up and run straight out the door. The old woman's breathing became audible as she drew closer to Jell's bed, and Jell braced herself, mentally preparing to explode from her place. The expected sound of sudden movement didn't come, though. Instead, Jell heard the sound of rustling and the familiar flutter of pages where she must have dropped her bag beside her when she'd fallen asleep. She cracked her eyes open just enough to see the old woman rifling through her things, cringing when her beloved book hit the floor. The old woman muttered something about rubbish and then continued going through Jell's underthings. As she searched, Jell had a flash of insight. So this was how Mila had come to possess so many objects. She must rescue people from the worms and then invite them inside. After feeding them and giving them a good night's rest, she claimed her plunder. But what did she do with her guests when she was done with them? Jell's heart nearly failed completely when a very large knife in the woman's right hand caught the light from the window and threw it around the room. But another look at Lucas had him shaking his head again. She was tempted to leap out of harm's way anyhow. But then, that would leave Dina completely exposed and at the mercy of their host. She would have to find another plan. After she was done pawing through Jell's bag, Mila turned to Jell. And before Jell could blink, Lucas had sprung from his bed and was on their host in a second. Jell flipped around to see Mila raise the knife, but Lucas had her by the wrist before she could bring it down. Jell leapt up and grabbed Dina by the shoulders. Yanking her out of bed, she deposited the protesting woman on the floor by the door before turning back at Lucas. He and Mila struggled for the weapon. He should have won the fight quickly, as Mila was half his size and quite old. But Mila reached down under the mattress and pulled a second knife, which she began to wave at him as well. Jell darted back to where Lucas was quickly being forced into a corner as Mila came at him, stumbling over a pot and struggling to stand. Think you're a match for Mila, do you? Foolish boy didn't even know to keep his girl safe. Jell looked around for something with which to distract the woman. Then she spotted the green rug beneath her feet. She reached down with both hands and yanked. Mila fell forward with a sharp cry, and for a moment, Jell feared she'd fallen on Lucas with the knife. But just as she was about to run over to check, Lucas leapt up. Go, he yelled. Jell ran back to her bag and started to stuff her things inside. We don't have time for that. Lucas cried as Mila got to her feet again. But Jell couldn't leave the book lying on the ground. She snatched it up and held it to her chest, looking up just in time to see Mila coming after her. She narrowly missed the knife again as she rolled. Mila let out a shriek as Lucas grabbed his mother, who was also screaming, and turned for the door. Rather than bothering to unlock the front door, he rammed into it with his shoulder. The wood, which must have been quite old, gave way on the first try, cracking loudly as the door crashed to the ground. Lucas. Dina sobbed, I can't. Lucas swept up his mother as Mila chased them down, and he and Jell darted back toward the hill from which they'd come. 
worms squished beneath their feet as they raced into the night, high-pitched squeals filling the air. But they didn't slow as footsteps pounded behind them. They lost speed quickly, as Lucas couldn't keep up while he carried his mother. She didn't help him either, screaming and clinging to him as her legs flailed in the air. Just as they got to the bottom of the hill, not far from where Dina had first fallen, Lucas tripped, and Dina tumbled down. The worms weren't as thick here, but as soon as Dina was on the ground, little white bodies began to inch their way toward her. Mila still clutched one of the knives as she ran for them, her curls sticking out in every direction and her mouth open wide, yelling as she charged. Lucas struggled to get Dina back on her feet. But just as he was finally able to get her to stand, Mila reached them. She grabbed at Jell's scarf. Come back, dear, and stay with me. I'll protect you more than this ungrateful imp will. Stay with him, and you'll all end up dead soon enough. Jell leaned back, but Mila pulled until the scarf dumped its contents. Dozens of shining gems sparkled in the weak moonlight, and Mila and Jell both stopped, seeming frozen in time. Just as Mila looked up at Jell, a new, wicked grin on her face, Lucas planted a solid kick to the woman's side. Then he grabbed Jell's hand and ran. And for the first time in her life, Jell was thankful for the dark of the forest in the dead of night. Chapter 17 Vittoria They walked for several more hours, far beyond the worms and until the moonlight began to fade and the gray of day began to take its place. Dina continued to whimper as they walked, eventually cajoling her son into carrying her again. Jell couldn't help feeling annoyed at this. The woman certainly hadn't spent much time looking at her son. He was clearly exhausted, as evidenced by the deep, dark bags beneath his eyes and his steps less sure than they had been before. Finally, as dawn came, Jell pulled everyone to a stop. You need to sleep. She faced Lucas and put her hands on her hips. He shook his head and rubbed his eyes. I'm fine. But even as he said it, his words slurred into a yawn. But you're going to have to walk again, mother. My arms are about to fall off. No, you're not fine. Jell looked around until she found a few relatively flat boulders. She started to reach for his hand, then thought better of it, pointing to the boulders instead. Over there. Your mother can rest as well. Dina mumbled to herself as she followed, picking her way over the underbrush, and Jell caught something to the effect of, it's about time. I'll take watch, Jell said, crouching in front of the boulder on which he Saturday, you sleep. He shook his head. You only slept for an hour last night, maybe two. I need to. You need to rest. Jell emphasized every word. If you want to do whatever it is you're here for, you're not going to do it by going without sleep for the next week and a half. You'll start getting sick by tonight, and you'll begin to lose your sanity in a few days. She looked down at his clothes. It's going to be warm and wet today. You should take off your coat so you don't overheat. No. She must have jumped at the sharpness in his voice because he sighed and rubbed his eyes. I'm fine, thank you, he said in a more subdued tone. I'll sleep. But the coat stays on. Jell nodded and backed up a few steps until she stumbled into a log beside the rock where Dina was preening herself in a little pool of water beside the boulder she'd claimed. Oh, don't take offense at him, dear. Dina waved her hand lazily at her son as his breathing deepened. He's been a bear since Lady Vittoria's father turned him down. Jell looked at her. Turned him down? Oh, yes. You see, she paused to give Jell a sickly sweet smile, Michael, my eldest, took after his father. All business and no fun. But Lucas here is a lot more like I was. She smiled, as though this were a good thing. Inside, Jell gagged. So far, she'd seen nothing in Lucas that was similar to his mother aside from her coloring. He had her nose, too. But as she was a handsome woman, this wasn't necessarily a bad thing. You should have seen him when he was little. Dina chuckled as she pulled her long, dark hair down and began to braid it. He would practice his flirting in the mirror. During his first official ball, he danced with every single girl in the room twice, even the ones who were several years older than him. 
At the end of the night, they were all sure he was going to propose to them the very next day. How old was he? Jell watched the prince as he slept. Selina had warned her of such rakes, and despite his undeniable bravery, she wasn't sure she liked this side of him. 13. And dashing as the day I met his father, only his father was twenty and six the day I met him, mind you. She sighed and stared up into the trees as though they were full of green leaves and beautiful blossoms, rather than skeleton-like branches the color of bone. Lucas had his first sweetheart when he was seven, and he kept a string of them through adolescence. One for every week of the year, we used to laugh. For some reason, Jell didn't think it was very funny. Is, she paused. Is he still like that? Well, he's an accomplished flirt, if that's what you mean. But he has begun to pare down the beauties on his arm. Particularly since the war. Those were, unpleasant days. Not as many balls and parties as I should have liked. She sniffed. He grew a lot less fun when Michael asked him to head the Navy. I was quite put out with Michael for that, you know. But Michael insisted. He claimed we'd lost too many men and needed, oh, what were his words? A sword in every man's hand, even after the war. And Lucas was all too delighted to do as he asked. Dina stuck her bottom lip out in an absurd pout. We actually thought he was going to be married by now. He still enjoyed his ladies, mind you, but after the war, he found only one he seemed to esteem over the others. Lady Vittoria. Dina nodded, leaning back over the pond to examine herself. One would think she'd have learned a little caution after her last experience with a pond. Lady Vittoria was honestly the most perfect fit I could see for him. I'd somewhat counted on the match. Lucas liked his fun, and Vittoria was one of the few girls who could keep up. In only a few months, he had us all convinced they would be wed before the year was out. What does she look like? Jell asked. She couldn't say why, but she was morbidly curious. Oh, she's absolutely breathtaking. Blonde curls the size of your fist. Lips as red as rubies, eyes like cornflower, framed tall and willowy. She gave Jell a smirk. Almost as thin as I was when I came out. A swan among ducks if I ever saw one. What happened? Jell nearly allowed herself a laugh. If she had truly been Lucas's betrothed, she couldn't imagine enjoying such a conversation from the very woman who had set them up. Oh, Lucas sought her hand from her father. But her father said that Lucas was, oh, I didn't even understand it, to be honest. She scoffed. He hasn't been the same since. All he ever pays attention to now are those absurd ships. Then she brightened. But all that is behind us now with you here. And don't mind him. He may pout, but your marriage shall work out splendidly. I just know it. And how do you know that? Jell couldn't resist giving her a slight tease. Dina's self-satisfied smile disappeared, and her eyes widened as Jell pulled her scarf forward and let the diamonds fall to the ground. It wouldn't have anything to do with these, would it? No. Of course not. Dina laughed nervously. All done for your happiness, I assure you. Jell was disinclined to believe the woman, but she refrained from saying so as Dina rested. If the woman was silly enough to have come here, she would hardly be of the mind to admit that her son's happiness wasn't her chief end. Dina stretched and curled up on the rock. Don't mind me. Since we're here, I'll just sleep a little as well. She opened one brown eye and waved for Jell to get down. You should, too, dear. I can't see your face but I can only suppose you're starting to look peaked. Jell forced a smile. Thank you, but I think I'll sit here and enjoy the sun. It was a weak excuse, as weak as the sunlight filtering through the gray clouds above. But Jell needed to keep watch. And if she was honest, she didn't really think she could sleep anyhow. The faster they were done with this suicidal trek, wherever it was leading, the better. She would get her sister back, King Everard would cure her, and they would start their life far from the royal family and its drama. And maybe she would find a man who wasn't in love with a blue-eyed blonde. Chapter 18 Manka 
Lucas's stomach grumbled as they walked up a gentle knoll. Mila's meal had been only the night before, but he felt as though he hadn't eaten in days. Jell had offered to share the rolls her sister had put in her bag, but Lucas had recommended they save them until they were truly desperate. His mother, however, oblivious to such threats, had greedily gobbled up two of the rolls, and her continued whining that had begun again within the last hours had made him suspicious that she wanted the third and fourth, too. After waking up, the rest of the morning had been rather uneventful. The few hours sleep had truly done him good, and he'd been more than grateful that Jell, true to her word, had kept watch over them after all. As much as his instincts told him to distrust the girl, he knew he was quickly coming to rely on her and would need to do so more as this journey continued. She seemed to be married to the idea that the King of Destin could really help her sister. Hopefully, that would fire her to be faithful through the end. Unfortunately, Jell was warming to him far more slowly than he was to her. The few times he attempted to draw her out with conversation, her returns were vague and bare of details, and as soon as she'd answered him completely, she would clam right back up again. And when Jell wasn't talking, his mother was. His musings were cut short, though, when they came to the top of the knoll to find the land on the other side cracked open. It was as if a giant had come and snapped the earth in half. The chasm was narrow, running in a straight line perpendicular to their path, but it was also deep and black enough that Lucas couldn't see its floor. He had been walking slightly ahead of the party, but now he threw out his arm to steady his mother. She stumbled into him a little, and probably would have fallen had he not stopped her. Lucas, what in the, then she saw the chasm. What is that, she shrieked, throwing her arms around him and clinging to him the way his little niece, Lucy, did when she'd had a nightmare. But Lucy was eight. And his mother was not. Amenka, Jell said. I don't remember seeing any of these around here the last time I came through with my father. It must be new. What is Amenka? Dina's voice trembled. It's a piece of the land that shakes violently until it splits open. Jell got down on her knees and leaned carefully toward the edge. This one is longer than most. And I can't see its depth. Which means we'll have to go over it. Lucas grabbed a fallen branch and started testing the ground closer to the opening. I'll cross first. Then I'll help you over one at a time. He led them to the place where the hole was most narrow, which was only a few yards away, and began poking it with his branch. The outcrop gave way the moment he touched it. He would have to jump and then find a safe place for the women to cross, as their legs weren't as long as his. He had the feeling that Jell would probably be willing to jump if asked, but he wasn't certain she would make it. And the idea of his mother jumping on her own was laughable. Jell, he said when he'd found sure footing, can you help my mother take a running start? A what? his mother cried. Before he could explain, though, the ground began to shake again, and the layer of soil closest to where they stood crumbled into the hole. Without waiting for the chasm to grow any wider, Lucas grabbed his mother by the waist and tossed her onto the other side. Then, without waiting to hear her shouts of indignation, he turned to Jell to do the same. As though it were in a race with him, though, the ground shook once more, and the chasm widened yet again. What will we do? Jell called above the noise, but Lucas didn't answer. He'd managed to reach a vine from one of the larger trees on the hill behind him. Once he had a good grip on it, he would grab Jell, and they would both jump together. If he could get both of them across the hole, they could roll down the hill before the ground quaked any more. Another violent shudder rocked the earth, and Lucas knew it was now or never. He reached out and wrapped his arm around Jell's waist. Jell hadn't been looking at him when he tried to pull her in. Instead, she'd been watching the chasm itself. But the second he touched her, she recoiled. Her ankle caught on a root, and she stumbled toward the chasm. Lucas watched in horror as the earth beneath her groaned, and the ledge she'd fallen on crumbled. Jell! Lucas shouted as he watched her disappear into the dark. He lay down on his stomach, having to hold his breath when a puff of dust came up out of the hole, and tried to adjust his eyes to the dark, praying the whole time that she wasn't dead. Jell. 
He called her name several times, each one making his heart fall lower in his chest, until after the fifth call, a familiar voice came up. I'm here. Her voice sounded faint, but he closed his eyes in relief. Then he opened them again to try to see if there was a way up or down. Once his eyes had adjusted, he could see that rather than a new hole, Jell had fallen in what likely had been a cavern. He could see the bare hint of a silver ribbon running through the bottom, probably a stream, and he could just make out different levels of land attached to the walls like shelves. Not close enough for him to reach her at the bottom, but if only he had a rope. Hold on, he called down. I'll be back. Fear alone had squeezed his chest before, but now another emotion began to pump his blood fast and heat his face as well. Stay right there, he barked at his mother as he ran, took his boots off, and prepared to climb the tree behind them. And don't you dare move until I come back. Once he was up in the branches, he searched until he found the top of the thick vine he'd just been holding. It wasn't as long as he would have liked, but it was thick enough and would be better than nothing. Then he found a second that was only slightly thinner, so he cut that one, too. Scrambling back down the tree, he tied the second vine to one of the boulders just outside the lip of the chasm and left it there, dangling over the edge. Then he tied the other to his waist, and using the vine that he'd attached to the boulder, he let himself down into the chasm. Thankfully, as he descended, the shaking seemed to stop. Once he'd lowered himself onto the first shelf near the top of the hole, he waited briefly for his eyes to adjust again. When they did, he saw that he had been right. There were numerous steps naturally carved into the rock. They would make descending much easier than if he'd tried to go straight down. He should have been relieved, but with each step, as he relived the moment over and over again in his head, his chest tightened, and his frustration grew. By the time he reached the bottom, he felt like he was ready to explode. What was that? he demanded as he made his way over to where she was standing. Then he paused and looked down. The ground was strangely soft. Now that he thought of it, she should have been killed by such a fall. It was at least a thirty-foot drop from the top. It's not as if I fell on purpose. She put her hands on her hips, but her voice shook. And I told you, I don't like being touched. He gaped at her. What did you think I was going to do? You don't grab women in Terra Phantom. Well, forgive me. He gave a mock bow. I'll take that into consideration the next time I'm trying to save you. Looks like you're doing a bang-up job down here on your own. She said nothing, but he could guess from the way her jaw lifted that she was glaring. Come on, he said, taking a step toward her and reaching for her arm, let me lead you back up. Her flinch was so discreet he nearly missed it, particularly as they still had very little light. And yet, it was there. Are you, he squinted at her in the dark. Are you really afraid I'll hurt you? No. He turned to face her directly but this time made no move toward her. I'm being honest, Jell. He paused. Are you afraid of me? No, she answered, again, too quickly. He shook his head and took a deep breath. What brought this on? She stared at the ground and turned her body toward the light, rather than to him. Look. He put his hands over his eyes then ran them through his hair. I don't. Hands are different. What? He dropped his hands to his sides again and blinked at her, cursing the wretched mask silently. Arguing would be a lot easier if he could see her face. I didn't know you were going to try to grab me like that. She stared at the ground. I only did what I've always done. Lucas cursed under his breath. Then he took a deep breath. Jell, he said, forcing his voice to remain calm. I only wanted to get us to safety. I know that, she blurted. I just don't like being taken by surprise. Lucas pinched the bridge of his nose. They had a mission to complete and he was in no mood to stand in a dark cave arguing with a girl who clearly had problems he was not able to fix. What then, he forced himself to speak slowly, can I do to get you to trust me so that the next time I have to save your life you don't end up falling over a cliff? You can tell me where we're going. 
she reached up and moved the scarf to let her diamonds fall into the soft ground beneath them. Would that change your mind? No, she retorted, but I would love to know whether or not I'm walking into a death trap. Why can't you just trust me? He was shouting now. What in my conduct has indicated I ought to be treated as a villain? If there's anything my sister taught me, Jell fired back, it was to never let a man have all the power without making him give some back. Lucas was about to embark on a tangent about her hypocrisy when her eyes widened, and she pointed at something behind him. What is it? he snapped. That shadow, she whispered. On the wall. It's not a shadow at all. What do you mean? Lucas groaned. I just saw it move. Lucas turned to see what she was pointing at. Sure enough, the dark spot beneath one of the walls was no longer a shadow. Instead, it moved down the wall until it had covered several of the stalagmites, turning them from a pale white to an inky black. The hair on Lucas's arms stood on end. It just moved toward us, he whispered back, taking a step away from the wall and toward Jell. Didn't it? Is that? Sorthlich. An icy shiver moved up his back. It sure looks like it. For once, Jell didn't seem to notice that he had moved closer to her. Instead, they both watched as the dripping from the stalactite above stopped. The place Lucas had stepped seemed even softer than before, but his foot hit something hard as well. Without thinking, he looked down. Only then did he realize that the ground on which they walked was not sand after all, but clothes. And animal skins. And bones. Lucas, Jell hissed, pulling his attention up once more. This time, where the water droplets had been falling from the stalactites, a single drop of thick, shiny black liquid rose from each of the three stalagmites and floated up into the air, where they hovered. Lucas got the distinct feeling that he was being watched. As he stared, he was yanked back in time to the day his brother had nearly killed him. There had been a shine in Michael's eyes and a darkness to his smile that Lucas had never seen before as his older brother had stood over him, gloating as Lucas's blood dripped from his knife. And now Lucas was looking that darkness in the eye. Jell, he said in a low voice. Yes. Her voice was even quieter. I'm going to take your hand, he reached back slowly, and we're going to run. For once, she listened. They both broke into a sprint. Jump, he yelled as they came to the place where the shadow had left a trail of darkness during its travel from the wall to the stalagmites. She jumped, and then they were making their way up the shelves. He could see why she'd had trouble seeing the ledges from the bottom. Looking up into the distant light was blinding when contrasted with the dark, wet walls that surrounded them. On the fourth ledge up, Lucas began to feel hopeful. Until he looked back to see the shadow following them. It slid up the walls and ledges behind them as though gravity had no hold. Faster. Jell screamed. Still, several of the ledges were too tall, and he had to pull her up with the vine. By the time they reached the top, Lucas felt like his legs might fall off. But when they fell gasping into the sun, he was sure they'd made it. One glance back at the hole, however, told him they weren't safe yet. The shadow was crawling up the vine, withering it as it moved, inch by inch, toward the top. Jell ran to the boulder around which the vine was tied and tried to pry it loose, but Lucas pulled her away. Don't touch it. We have to get rid of it. I know. He whipped the bow off his shoulder and fitted an arrow. You're going to attack it with arrows, she screamed. He exhaled and loosed a prayer and the arrow. Just as the shadow made its way to the top, his arrow sliced through the thick, green vine, severing it completely. Both the vine and shadow fell back down the hole. The world began to quake once more, this quaking harder than any they'd endured so far. Lucas didn't even attempt to stand until the shaking was done. When he finally did sit up, he was amazed to discover that the earth had been pushed back together, the hole was gone, and the path had been restored. He and Jell looked at one another, unable to answer his mother, who was still moaning about the indecency of it all. What just happened, he panted as his heart refused to slow. What was that? 
The land, she gasped, sounding just as out of breath as he was. I told you the land is cursed. It's not so bad in some places, but in others, she shook her head. Sometimes the land is worse than the people. It eats people. Lucas continued to stare at the place where the ground had opened. A slight crack no wider than his thumb was all that remained. Why does the ground eat people? He looked at her again. Have you seen this before? No. But I've heard of it. He shivered. He'd listened to Michael's stories of the darkness in the ocean that Ariana was ever responsible for repressing. But never before had he been so close to it or known evil could be so visceral that he could feel it in his bones. They spent a long time sitting that way. Finally, he pushed himself to his feet. My mission, he said, is to repay to the king a debt my grandfather borrowed when my kingdom was impoverished and at war. He swallowed. If I fail, your king is going to break down the gates and loose all of Terra Phantom on my kingdom. And every man, woman, and child will be in more danger than they knew was possible before this day. He extended his hand to her. And I need your help to do it. She kept her face turned up toward him for several long seconds before slowly putting her hand in his and letting him pull her to her feet. And it might be worth considering, he said in a softer voice before turning back to the path, that your sister might know a good many things about Terra Phantom. But she might be wrong sometimes as well. And with that, he rejoined his mother, leaving Jell in silence behind him. Chapter 19 Thank you. Jell's conscience aided her for the next two days as they made their way uneventfully. She and Lucas said little, and he didn't bring up her stubbornness or the chasm situation again. For that she was grateful. In truth, she felt deeply mortified over her initial response to his touch, because she truly did get the feeling that Lucas would be the last person to take advantage of her, particularly in a life and death situation. A lifetime of mistrust wasn't something to be overcome easily, though, and when he'd reached for her, her body had acted the way it might on the street if a stranger had come up behind her. Thoughts of her overreaction aside, however, even worse was that in her head and heart, she felt as though the world was out of sync. And it wasn't just because she was traveling with strangers through a part of her country that she'd never been in before as she spoke diamonds into existence. No, it had something to do with Lucas and his nagging suggestion that niggled at her mind every time she closed her eyes to sleep. But she might be wrong sometimes as well. Selena wasn't wrong. She'd spent too much time around men. The stories of the men at the tavern and their habits and words and excessive selfishness that Selina had shared had never ceased to amaze Jell, though Selina had seemed resigned to the fact that such was the world. And she'd spent years ensuring Jell had a perfect understanding of this truth as well. Men looked out for their own selves. Even her father, as much as she had loved him, had proved her sister right in his refusal to send Jell and her mother back to his relatives and then in his marriage to Chiara and his refusals to listen to Jell's pleas not to wed the awful woman. The only man Jell had ever found this maxim to be questionable in was the holy man before he died. Such was to be expected, though, she supposed, of a man who had time only for his god. But now Lucas was part of her world. And she really didn't have the slightest idea of what to do with him. He didn't fit into any of the neat little boxes Selena had painted for her of the male sex the weak or the tyrannical. Instead, he, if she was honest, had done everything possible to honor her. None of it made sense. Her greatest relief, as she tried silently to work out the dissonance in her head, was the distraction of entertaining Dina. Or rather, of keeping Dina on a short leash so Lucas could focus on keeping them all alive. Because if she didn't, Lucas's mother might not make it after all. Really, Dina wheedled as they made their way up yet another hill, I don't understand why we can't stop somewhere and buy a horse. She stopped and glanced at Jell. We have more than enough wealth. We have more wealth than anyone could ask for. Mother, we've been over this. And what do we do? We bury it in the ground. Every few hours we stop just so she can bury 10,000 gold pieces worth of diamonds in the dirt. Mother, we're not using. Yes, I know. You've told me. I'm not deaf. 
Will you stop going on about it then, he roared. I've been carrying you at least three times a day. What more do you want? Lucas, Jell hissed, holding her finger up to her mouth. In truth, she sympathized with him. But his voice carried farther than Dina's, and he was going to get them killed. He gave her an annoyed look, then rolled his eyes before stomping ahead. Then you can walk next to her, he muttered. Jell nearly laughed. As grumpy as he was, she couldn't blame him. At least Dina didn't have a thousand embarrassing stories to share about her. As he walked ahead of them, Jell realized the sun was at its zenith, and Lucas was still wearing his black coat. Why don't you take your coat off, she asked as she puffed, trying to keep up with his long strides. It's only going to get hotter. Too late did she realize she'd broken her self-imposed rule about only speaking to him when necessary in order to avoid further complication. But his attachment to the coat really was odd. He just shook his head. No thank you. Jell shook her head, too. She was about to let it go, but Dina called, ignore him, Jell. He's just being bizarre as always. She came huffing up behind them. Just like he was with Lady Vittoria. She clicked her tongue. If you ask me, Lucas, you weren't attentive enough, and her father's a fool. Lucas's resolute expression turned to one of horror. What do you know of my correspondence with Lorenzo, mother? Dina shrugged and fanned herself with a large, broken leaf she'd found on the ground. I read her letter. If Lucas was red earlier, he was nearly purple now. You did what? Well, I supposed it was her father's letter, and since Lorenzo and your father were friends. That's it. Lucas threw his mother's pack on the ground. Mother, I have had it. From now on, you are forbidden from talking. I'm what? Dina scowled. You heard me. You're not allowed to talk anymore. Not about food, not about friends. Not even about the family. And that includes me. Why ever not? Lucas bent until he was eye to eye with his mother, his hazel eyes flashing. Because you make everything worse. He pointed back in the direction from which they'd come. I don't know what you think you're doing here, but whatever it is, it's ruining everything. I'm doing nothing of the kind. Dina protested, but Lucas's frown only deepened. Do you know what happens if I don't successfully pay the king back what grandfather borrowed? For the first time, Dina looked a little uncomfortable. Lucas continued. The king of this charming land will start a war. And if you thought the war with the mare people was bad, this one would be ten times worse. He picked up the pack again and put it on indignantly. Our people will not only be poor and destitute, but they'll be pulled from their homes and murdered in their beds. Their little ones will cry out, and no one will be there to help them because my military isn't recovered enough yet to thoroughly protect the kingdom. I will die, and you and Jell will probably be sold to strangers as spoils of war to enjoy as they see fit. He glared down at his mother. Do you understand now? We cannot go to war. We will not survive another war. And if I fail now, our kingdom as we know it will die." Dina's lip quivered. Instead of looking thoroughly cowed, she looked like she was going to cry. Jell took the opportunity to come up beside him before they could take the argument any further. She'd been waiting to talk with him, hoping Dina would sleep sometime without overhearing, but now seemed as good a time as ever, before their argument alerted the entire forest to their whereabouts. I'm sorry, she said softly as he held back a branch for her. He blinked at her. For what? It's, she took a big breath before her courage failed her. It's not that I don't want to trust you. He waited until his mother had passed, and they were a little way ahead of her again. I know it must be difficult to trust a stranger, he finally said, but his voice was stiff, and she wondered if she detected a faint hint of hurt. Lucas. She stopped walking. He stopped as well. This is all I've ever known, she said, hoping, willing him to understand the chaos that had been eating her up from the inside. But my sister spent her childhood on the outside. And when she came, she became the protection I lost when my father died. Doesn't it make sense at least that I would struggle to trust a man I've only just met? Particularly one, she added, 
who wants to venture into the darkest part of my world without telling me why. He opened his mouth to answer, but several shouts captured their attention. Darting behind the nearest knoll, they peeked over the top to find the source. Jell saw it first. She tugged on Lucas's sleeve and pointed through the trees in the direction their path led. A road crossed through the forest, perpendicular to the one they were following, and a crowd of at least thirty surrounded something. A few men, women, and children darted this way and that, running back up and down the road with random objects in their hands. But most of the crowd was angry and focused on something in its center. Lucas waved his mother over to them, and for once, she listened. They all lay against the hill. We'll stay here, Lucas whispered, until they're gone. Hey, a man from the other side shouted. Out there. In the forest. Come here. Jell looked at Lucas, but he was staring into the forest, one hand on his sword, the other on his bow, which was slung across his chest. Before he could respond, four men appeared, two on each side of their little knoll. Jell's heart nearly stopped. They should have run when they had the chance. Now the men had seen them, and with Dina, there was no way they could outstrip any pursuers in the forest. Get up, one of the men said as he brandished a club. When they hesitated, he fixed his eyes on Jell. The marshal's not angry. He only has a few questions. Lucas glanced at her, and she sighed and nodded slightly. There was no escaping now. As they made their way down the hill, she could see that the crowd surrounded an overturned carriage. A man and woman stood in the center of the group, the woman sobbing and the man ordering everyone else to back off. Which one's the marshal? Lucas whispered. See the one in the red and brown, she murmured. The one telling everyone to stay away. Hello, there. The marshal turned to them as they approached, a pleasant smile on his whiskered face. Who do we have here? He looked appreciatively at Dina. Dina colored and smiled, and Jell rolled her eyes. Foolish woman. Getting noticed here should be the last thing she wanted. We're breaking no rules, sir, Lucas said, holding his hands out. I assure you. And I'm sure you're telling the truth. The whiskered man said with a pleasant smile. But as we're already here, I was hoping perhaps you'd seen something of this accident. Unlike Dina, Jell did her best to avoid their notice. So instead of trying to attract his attention, she kept her face turned toward the accident. The carriage was not a fancy one, but definitely large enough to have been hired. Whoever the criminal was, he or she must have brought enough money to rent such a sizable vehicle. The woman who was crying was dressed in clothes nicer than the vast majority of those in Terra Phantom would ever set eyes on. But from the way she was weeping, Jell could see that her neck was free of any marks, and she got the sick feeling that this poor woman's horrible introduction to her new life, however her move to Terra Phantom had come about, was about to get even worse. We only just arrived, Lucas said. We had only because we heard many voices. The marshal nodded. I'm sure. Particularly with a wife and mother in tow. But even as he spoke, he frowned. But why the mask? Lucas remained silent on the matter, only nodding respectfully. But instead of letting the matter drop, the man caught Jell's right wrist and examined it. Her blood ran cold. Not married, then. He eyed her with a new curiosity. Betrothed, Lucas said quickly. Marshal, a fat man on the other side of the carriage barked. Are you going to tell us what to do with this or not? The marshal reached out and grabbed one of the skinny boys who was about to make off with a painted clay jar, snatched it from his hands, and gave the boy a scowl and a good shake before letting go. Mind your manners, he growled at the boy. I said nothing was to be touched, and that goes for you street urchins as well. Then he turned back to the man. Of course. Now, as this woman is now unprotected. She's a widow, sir. One of the older women called out. Not some young girl without a mind for the world. And her husband only died here an hour ago. Rightly so, madam, the marshal said. But as she is new to the land, she'll need someone to help her find her place. Couldn't we just send her back to the gate? The objector's husband asked. 
Her husband was the reason she was here. Why keep her here to eat up more resources when we could just send her back? She won't make it as far as the next town over, the fat man sneered. We might as well give her a protector. His bulbous eyes grew even wider. You could marry her off here and now. He can marry people? Lucas whispered, his nearly inaudible words still sounding horrified. Jell nodded. So he can give a woman protection on the spot. She shuddered. He even carries the tools needed to mark her as well. Tools? Lucas whispered. Who here would be willing to take responsibility for this woman? The marshal asked, interrupting Lucas's thoughts. Several men raised their hands, much to Jell's chagrin, while a few others called out with the first man that she should be brought back to the gate to go free. Voices rose, and the likelihood of a fight became palpable. Jell jumped when she felt a slight pressure on her hand. But when she turned, it was Lucas. He'd taken his mother's hand as well. He nodded at the marshal, who was now trying to calm the frenzy that was beginning to take the crowd. Jell nodded, but they'd only taken a few steps backward toward the forest when the marshal turned back to them. Hold on. The marshal jogged up to them and fixed a hard stare on Lucas. What exactly are your intentions with this girl? Lucas stepped slightly in front of Jell so he and the marshal were face to face. Jell prayed this wouldn't lead to a fight. Because if the mob saw a new citizen fighting with a marshal, as little as most of them liked the marshals, they wouldn't for a second hesitate to defend their lawman. We were just betrothed less than a week ago, Lucas said firmly. To Jell's great relief, there was no hint of uncertainty in his voice this time. Betrothed. The man raised his eyebrows, and a smile played on his lips. You are quite new here, aren't you? He chuckled slightly. I could marry you now, and all of this would be solved. Marshal, the fat man yelled again, but this time, the marshal ignored him. Jell thought fast. They couldn't get married now. Especially not when he was in love with another woman, or when she had a million plans that he wasn't a part of. I want my sister to be there, she blurted. The marshal looked at her again. And how far away is your sister? She lives with my stepmother several days north of here. Jell did her best to remain calm. The man stared at her for a long time. She knew he couldn't see through the mask, but it was unnerving to have him stare so long. Finally, he let out a gusty breath and rubbed his eyes. I may be a marshal, but I'm also a father. He ran his hand over his balding head. And I don't know where your father is to let you run about with your betrothed. He's dead, Jell said. Which is why I need to stay with my betrothed. Fair as that may be, he continued, you need to remove the mask. Why? Lucas asked. The man looked at him in surprise. You really are new here. Look, son, that mask is a dead giveaway that she's unclaimed. And without even a mark on her wrist, she's as good as someone else's. It would be different if her father were with her, but, he huffed. I'll let you go free this time. Lucky for you, the king is pressing us to make our laws more modern in those aspects, or rather, more like other kingdoms. His eyes darkened. But few people around here care what the king says. And few marshals for that matter. Lucas nodded. Noted. And thank you. You're letting them go, too, someone called, but Lucas didn't wait to hear what else was said for as soon as the words were out of the marshal's mouth, he had Jell and Dina by the wrists and was dragging them across the road and into the forest once again. No one followed them, much to Jell's relief, but her heart couldn't seem to keep a steady rhythm as they continued to stumble through the underbrush at breakneck speed. Even Dina stayed unusually quiet for a while. But after half an hour, she begged to stop at a creek so she could soak her feet. Lucas, uncharacteristically quiet as well, let her stop without a word. As he stood, scanning the forest in the direction from which they'd come, Jell went up to him. She couldn't look him in the eye as she spoke, for it was far too humiliating. How pathetic he must think her to have to rely on others so heavily for her welfare. Thank you, she said, playing with the end of her braid, for saying that. Hey. 
Rough fingers gently took her chin and turned her face up to his. We're in this together. We made an agreement, and I'm not backing out. Her breath hitched slightly at his touch, but, she realized, it wasn't an unpleasant sensation. For a long moment, he studied her, as though trying again to see through her mask. And she studied him back unabashed. Oh. His gaze fell to his hand, and he yanked it back. Sorry. Then he laughed nervously. Habit, I suppose. But for the first time, Jell's smile didn't feel forced. It's all right. He gave her a funny grin that turned into a grimace. I hate to ask this, he said, but is there any way you could take that thing off? He nodded at her face, and immediately, her hand went up to her mask. It would be safer, of course, to travel without it. Married women didn't wear masks. A mask meant protection and innocence. If she removed hers, she wouldn't be questioned nearly as much, and they wouldn't constantly be checking her wrist. But it would also mean stripping herself of her last vestige of power. I'm sorry, she whispered. I can't. She couldn't bring herself to look at him, and when he didn't respond, she knew she'd gone too far. He was angry, and she knew it. Such a reaction would be understandable. The attention she would draw by continuing with a mask and without a mark would put them all in greater danger. But instead of shouting or fuming or even ignoring her completely, she felt the hand again, lifting her chin to look at him once more. And to her even greater surprise, he was wearing a kind smile. Then we'll just have to be more careful. You're, not angry? He chuckled. I'm not saying this is going to be easy. And I won't pretend to understand. His smile faded softly, and he stared once more into her eyes, though how, she didn't know. But if it means that much to you, we'll just have to find another way. Though he couldn't see her, Jell smiled back. Thank you. Chapter 20 Human Five Days They'd been walking for five days, and Lucas was about to lose his mind. In front of him was a wasteland, and behind him was, his mother. Brown seemed to be the only color in Terra Phantom. Even the leaves on the trees were a dull green, which was odd, considering it rained often. The mud and his mother's poor choice in footwear severely hampered their progress. They must have doubled the time it should have taken to cross the scattered rocky outcroppings, fallen trees, and lots of underbrush. And dragging his mother through it all was like pulling teeth. Thankfully, they hadn't met anyone else since the overturned wagon, so his mother's constant complaining was unlikely to be heard by anyone but them. Still, as the days dragged on, he grew more and more restless. They were just over a week from the deadline, and they seemed to go more slowly by the day. What about this assignment hadn't his mother ruined? Lucas cast a sideways glance at Jell. She'd been quiet since the day they met, but after the wagon incident, she'd seemed more silent than ever. She would answer when asked a direct question, but she rarely offered any other information. And yet, though he couldn't see her eyes, he got the distinct feeling that she was watching him more than ever. And he didn't know what to make of it. Not that he'd been a ray of sunshine, either. His mother seemed to make it her goal to keep him in a sour mood, and the constant quiet drove his thoughts far too often to his beloved. What was she doing right now? How had she taken her father's refusal? He hadn't spent enough time with her yet to be sure of what her temper would be when she heard that she could no longer be the object of her prince. Had she shed tears over the loss of what could have been? She'd sobbed the day she'd received news that her cat had died. She'd been at the palace with her mother that day. Dina had invited them over for tea, and Lucas had been home between voyages. They'd known one another for years, of course, as her father was part of Michael's court. But when the missive arrived, silent tears had begun to course down her cheeks. And in that moment, he had the distinct need to comfort her, to protect her from whatever it was that had made her cry. That had been the catapult for their first long walk through the market. She spent the time talking about her dear little cat, and he listened in raptures, certain she was the sweetest creature he'd ever met. In an effort to get her to smile, he bought her a pretty little hat she admired, 
and the way she blushed and smiled at him through wet lashes had melted whatever was left of his heart. He'd also bought them each a piece of honeycomb to chew on as they walked. Unfortunately, he hadn't considered the practicality of giving a honeycomb to a woman in a delicate dress. But instead of crying out in dismay when a glop of honey landed on her skirts, she'd only laughed and tried to smear it on his face. He'd realized that day, without a doubt, that he needed someone with a sense of adventure, rather than one of the delicate flowers his mother so often shoved at him. Someone who could laugh at a glob of honey rather than cry. He'd known then and there that he needed Vittoria. Only now, she wasn't to be his. Where did that leave him? Lucas shook his head. If he didn't get some real conversation going soon, he just might go mad. But his mother was the last person with whom to have a sensical conversation, and Jell refused to give him more than one or two word answers to his questions. Still, her answers had grown softer and less bristly than they had been before. Maybe he could goad some sort of emotion from her if he chose the right angle. Jell, he said, clearing his throat as he stopped to help his mother over a log. How does one find all the answers? She turned her head toward him, and though he couldn't see her face, there was surprise in her voice. Find all the answers. Lucas smiled. He'd been exceptionally good at needling his sister when they were small. He could move her from a good mood to a muttering mess in two minutes flat without even touching her. And as touching gel was off the table, he would just have to employ his power of words. You're just so, put together, he said, holding another branch back so the women could pass through. There has to be something that. That what? Her reply was indignant. I don't know. Makes you a little less perfect. I am not perfect. She walked slightly faster. You should know that after the manka. He shrugged. Everyone's allowed their mishaps. You're a healer. You have the patience of a heavenly being with my mother. What? Dina cried from behind them but Lucas ignored her. You have all these plans to escape this awful place, including, he gave her a wry smile and arched an eyebrow, somehow convincing me to make a deal with you, so you could lead me into the depths of this mud hole. I don't know. I just don't see how you qualify as an actual human. He could hear her start to say something then stop several times. You could change my mind, he said coyly. Her chin rose slightly higher. And how would I do that? I'll ask you questions. Answer me honestly, and you might convince me that you're at least half human. She kicked a rock out of the way harder than was necessary. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Yes. Yes, I would. He grinned then paused. What questions should he ask her? Which ones would she answer? He was rather sure he couldn't push too hard but she did seem to have a slightly competitive edge. Maybe he could work around that. But first, he would warm her up. What's your favorite food? Lemonade with mint. That's not a food. She turned to him, and in the light of a weak sunbeam, he nearly imagined that she was scowling at him. So you're going to be choosy now with my answers. She tossed her hair. I could refuse to answer any more. He squinted at the trees. Do you even grow lemons here? Or have sugar, for that matter? No, she paused. But the holy man once brought a few lemons with him when he came back from visiting outside the wall. He was allowed to leave. Holy men and guards are the only ones allowed to come and go at will. Anyhow, my father had managed to buy some sugar from a newcomer at the market. She pulled an acorn from a tree and tossed it into the woods. It was the best thing I've ever tasted. Lucas hadn't expected such an answer, and it was half a minute more before he could pretend to be unaffected. When they got out of this horrible place, assignment or no assignment from his brother, he was going to make sure Bethia had a chance to stuff gel full of sweets to her heart's content. All right, fine. He pretended to scoff. Have your sour water. What about pets? Have you ever had one of those? No. But when I do, I'll get a dog, and I'll name him Edom. Edom. 
He could hear the smile in her voice this time. Yes. So he can do just that to anyone I don't like. Lucas stared at her for a minute before letting out a laugh. Fair enough. What about? It's my turn now. He huffed. But really, it was only fair. Also, it was nice to finally have her carrying on a real conversation. Fine. What do you want to know? What's Victoria's favorite food? He began to speak but stopped. I, I don't know. How did he not know that? Very well, then. What about her deepest desire? I don't follow. What does she want to do with her life? Jell reached out and plucked a dying flower from the grass on the side of the path, then she rubbed it between her fingers and sniffed at it. What are her dreams? What mark does she want to leave on the world? Once again, Lucas found himself stumped. Not that he would own such. She wants a new kitten. Mmm. What about her favorite color? Blue. It's pink, his mother puffed. She told me at the market. Can we slow down a bit? What did she think of her father's refusal to your request for his blessing? Jell continued. Lucas opened his mouth, but again, no words came. He'd been denying it to himself for months, but now that Jell asked, he could only answer faintly, she didn't. Jell came to a stop and turned to face him. Didn't what? He stared up at the eternal gray of the sky. She didn't write to tell me what she thought. When he looked back down, she was nodding slowly. Just as I thought. He faced her as well, folding his arms over his chest. What is? I don't think you're in love with Vittoria. For once, Lucas found himself speechless. Excuse me? You don't know anything about her. She leaned slightly closer. I think you're in love with the idea of Vittoria, rather than Vittoria herself. His mouth fell open, and he could almost feel her laughing at him. He knew Vittoria. He knew that she hated dogs. Her favorite sweet was, obviously honey. And she wanted a son and a daughter, though she said an extra boy might not be so terrible, so as to preserve the line of her future husband. Well, he sputtered as she turned and began to walk again. For someone who isn't in love, how do you know so much about it? I don't. But I know what love isn't. I also know that men on both sides of the wall can be guilty of betrayal where love ought to reign the most. How so? Before my sister came here, she said, as if discussing the price of radishes, her father was the betrayer. What did he do? Lucas asked uneasily. Did he want to know? Nothing. He did absolutely nothing. Her hands balled at her sides, but only for an instant before she flexed them and seemed to find her calm again. Then, when she was here, she betrothed herself to a man who, like us, wanted to leave Terra Phantom. What happened? She took in a deep breath. My stepmother found out, and as I can only assume she threatened to tell his father, they decided to make a deal. She straightened her shoulders. It's expensive to travel the main road. If you're not in a large group or don't have some sort of special protective status, you have to hire guards like your mother did when she came to fetch me. So he took all the money we'd saved together, all three of us, and found someone new. They fled, and my stepmother made sure we never attempted anything like that again. Her voice hardened at the end, and Lucas was struck by the desire to know just what her stepmother had done to prevent them from running. He was also struck by how angry such a story made him on her behalf. What kind of woman was her stepmother that she would contrive to keep her daughters in such a place? We need to stop. Dina let out a moan and collapsed on a boulder. I can't go on. All right, Lucas said, stooping to help her up onto the rock. Let's see what it is this time, his words trailed off when Jell took off his mother's shoe. Throughout the journey, Jell had been stuffing his mother's slippers with soft cloths and a salve, which she said would prevent the shoe from rubbing her skin too badly. But now the slipper itself had been worn through, and his mother's feet were covered in blisters, several of them bloody. Regret compounded his self-loathing. 
five days of walking for the woman who didn't like to walk from the palace to the beach. Of course his mother would be suffering. Because he needed another reason to feel guilty. We'll need to get her new shoes, Jell said, looking up at him while still holding the shoe. Or better yet, a donkey. She can't keep walking like this. He flexed his jaw. Do you think paying a merchant will be safe? He'd spent most of his spare coins to pay for his room at the inn while he searched for another guide. But using the diamonds would be dangerous, to say the least. Jell let out a long, slow breath. I don't know how else we'll be able to go on. She stood and looked in the direction they were going. There should be a village with a sizable market about a day from here. My father used to venture there for medicinal supplies. If we stick to the outer stalls instead of going farther in, we should be able to avoid most of the attention. And whoever we pay isn't going to want anyone else to see what we give him, so he'll probably be quiet about the whole transaction. We'll just need to make sure we're discreet in our payment. Lucas nodded and bent to pick up his mother, who was crying softly. Come on, mother, he said, more gently than he had in a long time. Let's get you a ride. That evening, when they stopped to make camp, Lucas noticed Jell wincing as she rubbed one of her heels as well. How are your feet? He nodded at her worn boots as he built a small fire. Dina was already snoring on a blanket on the little place he'd cleared for her on the ground. Jell sighed. I'm fine. No, you've been limping for the last few miles. He moved from the fire pit he'd dug to kneel at her side. Doing so was painful, as his back ached immensely, but he ignored it as he looked at her boot. Jell sighed again and slowly removed her boot. Sure enough, there were red welts on her heels and toes. I guess I'm not used to walking quite this much, either, she laughed nervously. He reached out to turn her foot so he could see it better, but before he could touch her, she jerked back. He held his hands up and fell back a step. I'm sorry, he said. I wasn't thinking. I just. No, it's my fault. Jell put her boot back on and hugged herself. Habit, I suppose. She turned, and briefly, he thought he saw the ghost of a sad smile through the mask. Sorry. If you don't mind me asking, he said, pulling out the remains of the berry cakes Jell had mashed together that morning, how long have you been wearing the mask? Jell took her cake and turned it slowly in her hands. I was nearly thirteen. Did your father give it to you? She nodded. He did. Said he didn't want men following me around, since I was starting to look like a woman. And you said you can't take it off. Why did he so desperately want to see her face? I'm the only one who can remove it. But once it's off, I can't put it back on. What are you waiting for? He stoked the fire, daring another glance in her direction. You're what, eighteen? Nineteen, she said, straightening, a touch of indignation in her voice. Then she slumped slightly again. The day Seth betrayed my sister, I made a promise to myself that the only man I will ever take this off for is the man who I know loves me more than life. She laughed without humor. But at the rate it's taking me to leave this place, that's never going to happen. He slowly eased himself onto the log next to her so she wouldn't startle. You mean, you're willing to hide forever rather than take the chance that someone might think you're worthy of looking at? She stared at him. Or at least, he assumed so, as her face was less than a foot from his. When she spoke, her voice was faint. I'm keeping a part of myself sacred. The only part one truly have the power to keep in this world. I understand that. He frowned. But what about? Hello. Before he could finish his question, a man's voice called out in the twilight. Lucas leapt to his feet and grasped the hilt of his sword. Jell's shape dissolved quickly into the strange blue nothingness. It wasn't unexpected, but it was still slightly unnerving. A man stepped through the trees five seconds later. He was holding a lantern, and his eyes were on them. Thank goodness, he muttered before turning. You can come out now, he called behind him. 
There are only three. Chapter 21 Together Upon the stranger's announcement that there were three of them, Jell became visible once again. He didn't attack, though, at least, not immediately. Instead, he only held out a cautioning hand and shook his head. We mean you no harm, I promise. As he spoke, two more figures came up behind him and peered out of the trees, the smallest on horseback. Jell's heart, which had been thundering in her throat, finally slowed when she saw that they were a woman, probably in her fourth decade, and a girl whom Jell assumed to be their daughter. The girl was a bit younger than herself, probably fifteen or sixteen, and she looked a great deal like the man, with hair so blonde it was nearly white. Now that Jell thought about it, his accent wasn't one she'd ever heard before. And that was saying a lot, as Terra Phantom received criminals from all over the Western realm. Can we help you? Lucas asked, his hand beneath his coat where Jell knew he wore his sword. His words were polite but held a thinly veiled warning. We mean, the man said as the woman came to stand beside him, to head into Piata tomorrow. And we were hoping to perhaps join forces while in the city. Piata? Lucas echoed. The woman nodded. The town just north of here. The town is dangerous, the man said. Last time we were there, our daughter was almost taken. But it's the only place nearby that sells horse feed, and we're in desperate need. He looked at the fire. Would you mind if we joined you? We have some corn cakes we could share. Lucas looked down at Jell with questioning eyes, and Jell hesitated. Joining forces was common in Terra Phantom. Larger groups often meant more power and safety. But when comrades turned their backs on those who trusted them, it was easy to lose everything. Still, she did recall her father being rather nervous every time they'd ventured into this particular city. He'd even tied her waist with a rope and then tied himself to the other end, in case someone tried to snatch her. And as this man already had his own wife and daughter, they would naturally be slightly less inclined to do the damage that many of the young, unattached men were capable of. And after days of forest roots, berries, and rabbits, her stomach gurgled. The corn cake sounded like a feast. She couldn't speak, as she had to reattach her scarf. But once it was safely on again, she gave Lucas a small nod. He turned back to their visitors. Thank you then. Your presence is welcome. He indicated for them to sit. Oh, the man held out a hand to keep his family back. I apologize, but before we do, what mark do you carry? Jell had a moment of panic until Lucas pulled down his shirt. There, emblazoned on his neck, was the symbol for military desertion. Hopefully, it wasn't permanent. And yours? Lucas asked. The man pulled his shirt collar down as well to reveal the symbol for thievery. At least it wasn't a violent crime. My name is Gerhard Fischer, and this is my wife, Ingrid, and my daughter, Frida. Are you from Vasksum? Lucas asked. The man nodded. I was in the service of an earl. He grimaced. Made the mistake of thinking I could borrow some of his gold. Some was probably an understatement. Being thrown into Terra Phantom for thievery was rather rare and usually only reserved for the worst of thieves. But then, Jell couldn't help remembering her own father's unfair exile. Gerhard sighed and looked around. Had I known my punishment would be a shadow of this, I would have turned tail and never eyed a piece of gold again. His gaze fell on his daughter. Coming here, we had no idea our child would be in danger every waking moment. Now I've spent three years begging the maker every night to give us some reprieve. But my wife here won't leave without me. Don't know where we'd go, Ingrid said, flipping aside a blonde curl. My family disowned us as much as yours did. Frida remained silent as she stared into the fire, and Jell's heart went out to her. What it must have been like to come of age in a land such as this, without sunshine or kindness. Away from every promising marriage match she might have entertained as she grew closer to being of age? Jell might have grown up in Terra Phantom, but at least it wasn't a shock the way it must have been for this girl. The way it must have been for Selena. Do you live near here? Lucas asked, accepting the corn cakes the woman offered. About a day's walk. 
Gerhard pointed south. We often tarry around this area to find others with situations similar to ours. He gestured to Jell and Dina. Not everyone is a brood in Terra Phantom. He took a bite of his corn cake. Now, what about you? Seems dangerous to be riding with your girl unclaimed, Ingrid said, examining Jell's mask. The food in Jell's mouth went dry. We're engaged. Lucas gestured to his mother who was still asleep. That's my mother. We need to get her some new shoes tomorrow and some sort of beast for her to ride. She can't keep up with all the walking. Oh, Lucas was good. Jell couldn't help being impressed by his ability to gloss over the topic of their engagement and focus on his mother. The fewer questions, the better. Unfortunately, Ingrid didn't seem to care about Dina or her riding situation. Engaged or not, you'll need to do something about that, she waved her corn cake at Jell's face. I don't know how long you've been here, but those masks announce to the world that you've got a bud ready to blossom. Most foolish practice if I ever saw one. It's only until we're Mar, Lucas began, but Ingrid cut him off. Then get married quick. Because as long as you go parading her around like that, especially in places like Piata, you're just asking for someone to knife you and take both your girl and your mother. Jell could barely swallow her food. The woman was right. Not only was her mask an enticement, a challenge for some, but with Dina being a handsome woman herself, the temptation might be more than a horde of criminals could bear. And if the Prince of Maricanta was killed and his mission failed, his whole kingdom would suffer. And Lucas would be dead because of her. I'm going to get some firewood, Jell squeaked as she stumbled out into the night. But before she'd gone ten steps, heavier steps ran up behind her. It was Lucas. He stood there, one hand half stretched out, looking quite unsure of himself. Jell, he pulled his hand back. What's wrong? But Jell just shook her head, trying to keep her tears at bay. You'll need to go into town without me. And why would I do that? Jell pointed back at the camp. She's right. As long as I'm wearing this mask, I'm a danger to you and your mother. She pressed her hands to her sides and flexed them, willing her voice not to tremble so precariously. Lucas just watched, his face unreadable in the distant, flickering firelight. I, Jell took a deep breath. I wish I could do what she's suggesting. I really do. But I, I just can't. She started to pace as her breathing sped until panic threatened to make her chest explode. Hot, angry tears began to fall, heightening her frustration. Of all the things. If there was a god in this world like the holy man had claimed, why would he put her in this situation? Why would he threaten to take away the one source of power she had over herself? Strong hands reached out and took her by the shoulders. Lucas turned her to face him, and when he did, her breath caught in her throat. His eyes were wide as he searched her mask, and there was none of the resentment that there should have been given their situation. We'll find another way, he said, leaning toward her until their faces were only inches apart. I told you I'm not going to ask you to remove your mask. And I plan on keeping my word. She shouldn't believe him. A week together wasn't long enough to truly know someone not the way she should if she was going to trust him. And yet, the panic quickly evaporated, and in its place, something new sprouted in her chest. It was warm and felt oddly like what she imagined sunlight to be. How, she whispered. He gave her a half-smile. I've seen the Maker do more than you can imagine. He leaned even closer, the warmth of his whispers making Jell's heart trip over itself as she realized just how near they were. I'm not going to ask you to compromise yourself. And I'm not going to leave you alone in the forest. We're going to do this together, just like we agreed." She nodded, not trusting herself to speak. He held out his hand, and she took it without thinking. As he led her back to the campsite, she was startled to find herself wishing briefly that he wouldn't let go. She hadn't been touched like that since, well, since her mother had died. The sensation of his calloused hand enclosed around hers gave her a feeling of security. Which was dangerous. And yet, as they entered the campsite, an inexplicable peace settled over her. 
He sat down on the log beside her and began making conversation with their guests once again, letting go of her hand to reach for another corn cake. But Jell heard none of it. All she could think about was his touch and how this journey was becoming far more complicated than she'd bargained for. Chapter 22 Gone Lucas was grateful for their companions the next day as they took up their journey on the real road. Their hosts had offered to let Dina ride on the horse with Frida until they reached their destination, which put him in a better mood than he'd been all week. The feeling of walking on level ground was also a relief to his feet, but the eyes of those who passed them were far more disturbing than the comfort was worth. Every person they passed felt like a threat. Ingrid had made several changes to their party before leaving the campsite, and though Lucas had been annoyed at first, he was now grateful they were traveling with others who were more experienced than they. To begin with, Ingrid had removed Jell's scarf. Lucas nearly had a heart attack until he saw that the scarf was empty. I don't know what this is for, Ingrid had announced as she removed it. But it cannot be worn. Why not? Lucas asked uneasily, inexpressibly grateful that Jell must have dumped her diamonds that morning before everyone else woke up. Enough to cultivate curiosity. Ingrid pursed her lips. She's already got a mask. Why does she need another? Ingrid had shaken her head, answering herself, as was her habit. It must go. It was decided his mother would wear the scarf over her head and shoulders. It would help cover her fine gown. Still, even without the scarf, the looks their party received from passers-by kept Lucas from feeling at ease. Far too often, their gazes rested on Frida and Jell, and Lucas could see why Frida's parents didn't wish to go into the market alone. They could see the village long before they arrived, as the land in these parts was flat. The forest grew on the left side of the road, while potato fields grew to their right. I didn't know there were this many farms here, Lucas leaned down and whispered to Jell. Jell looked at the farms they were passing by, but without her scarf, all she could do was nod. The trees at the edge of the forest seemed slightly less muted than the woods they'd passed through the night before. The colors filled Lucas with a bit of hope, as did the little diamonds in his pocket. Not that he wanted them there. But Jell had secretly passed them to him that morning when their guests weren't looking. If everything went as planned, they would soon have new shoes for both the women and a donkey for Dina, and they could make their way to their destination at twice the speed they'd been going. By Jell's estimation, that was just under a week away, which would even leave them a few days to spare. Please let us make it, he prayed for the hundredth time that day. Jell was quiet as she walked, but Lucas was glad to note that she seemed to be more relaxed than the night before. She carried herself confidently this morning, her arms swinging slightly at her sides. She really was a pretty girl, so far as he could see. Still underfed, of course, but if that were remedied, she would have a strong build. Not at all heavy, but sturdy. Guilt aided him for not being able to fix that, at least yet. As soon as he got her back to the palace, Bithia would set to fattening her up a bit. He smiled to himself as he imagined his old servants scolding them all for keeping her so thin. Then it hit him. He'd made a deal to bring her back with him so he could introduce her to the fortiers. But now that he thought about it, a part of him really did want to bring her back, if for no other reason than to show her that the world really could be a wonderful place. He wanted her to know what it felt like not to be afraid. What had possessed him to touch her the night before, he still couldn't say. But her skin had been soft, and the moment he'd touched her, her trembling had ceased. He couldn't necessarily say why this pleased him so much, but it had. And, he realized, he wanted to do it again. But what did that mean? It meant he needed to get back to Vittoria. Lucas shook his head and tried to focus on the road ahead of him, rather than the girl at his side. Thankfully, they came to the town's edge before he could dwell on the topic too much. He needed to focus if they were all to get in and out safely. Frida had been instructed to kick her horse into a run at the first sign of trouble, and Dina, who had slept off and on all morning, had been instructed to hang on. Lucas had given her very specific instructions that morning, in private, to keep her mouth shut. 
She'd been affronted at the time, but at least she was doing as he asked. Lucas reached out and caught Jell's hand in his. She turned and looked up at him. I want you by my side the entire time. Not more than an arm's length away, he whispered while staring down a fat man who was looking at Jell with far too much curiosity. She nodded, and he straightened, but he couldn't help feeling a little satisfied that she hadn't pulled away. The town was large, but even as they entered, Lucas could see that it was still quite impoverished. Cottages, little more than shacks, lined the streets. Mud was everywhere. On the houses, on the animals, even on the children as they ran about in the uncobbled streets. The road they traveled, however, was busy, making Lucas pull Jell even closer to him. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see Gerhard doing the same with his wife. Frida and Dina rode between them. Lucas allowed Gerhard and his family to attend to their errands first, as he could use the time to familiarize himself with the market. It was indeed busy, even more so than the road traffic had indicated. But unlike the bustling markets at home, these stalls had little that was new to offer. Most of their wares, clothing, horse gear, weapons, even baubles, were dirted or cracked. He could only guess that this was because everything new that came into the country had to come from those who were newly exiled. Before Lucas had left, Michael mentioned that the crops grew so poorly it was difficult to supply the growing demand. On compulsion, Lucas leaned over and whispered in Jell's ear, wait until you see a real market when all of this is done. He didn't expect a reply, as they'd agreed it would be best for her not to talk and produce more gems, but to his surprise, she gave his hand a slight squeeze. And for some reason, that made him happy. They finally stopped at the feed store, one of the few log buildings in the market. Gerhard did his business, and Lucas stayed out with the women and the animals, glaring down anyone who looked too closely. After that, Ingrid said they needed a new dress for her daughter. This errand was also accomplished quickly, as the gowns were second-hand and there were only two that would even have fit Frida. Then it was Lucas's turn. Gerhard pointed them in the direction of a stall that had several skinny animals inside of it. While the old, half-broken mule would have hardly been Lucas's first choice, the man selling it was more than happy to trade the poor beast for a few diamonds. Then Gerhard guided them toward another stall that was closer to the middle of the market but still on the outskirts. Lucas would have liked to skip this part of the visit. People were pressed all about them, and he nearly lost his grip on Jell's hand twice as they tried to follow their guide over to the final stall. But they couldn't do without shoes, so he trudged silently along behind. Ramshackle would have been too good a word to properly describe the stall. But Lucas kept his mouth shut when he saw the few shelves of boots lining the stall behind the skinny man that greeted them. Lucas quickly found a pair for his mother after showing the man her slipper, and for once, she didn't protest. Then he turned back to the man. I need a pair that will fit her. He gestured to Jell. But I don't know if her current pair is really the right size. The man came out and measured Jell's current shoes with a notched stick. Then he went back into the stall and searched another pile of boots in the corner before finding a pair that was decidedly dirty. Do you have anything a little newer? Lucas asked. The man frowned until Lucas cast a careful glance around and leaned forward. Pulling the raisin-sized gems from his pocket, he gestured for the man to be quiet. How about one of these? The man's eyes nearly fell out of his head as Lucas opened his hand halfway, and he dove back into the pile with renewed gusto. Finally, he produced a pair that looked far better than the first. Lucas turned to where Jell was seated on a roughly hewn bench behind him. If you don't mind, he said quietly, gesturing to her leg. She watched him for a long minute, and he couldn't help praying that she would say yes, that she would trust him. Then, much to his delight, she slowly held out her leg. Gently, so as not to frighten her, he took her leg in his hand and pulled off the boot. He tried not to think about how warm and soft her skin was and instead tried to focus on the redness of her foot when he removed the shoe. After he'd taken it off, he placed the new one on her foot. The sole was worn but not nearly as badly as hers. How does that feel, he asked. 
As a bit of weak sun briefly parted the clouds, he thought he could see a small smile spread across her face. And it was stunning. Lucas felt as though he were rooted to the spot when Gerhard cleared his throat. Remembering himself and where they were, Lucas quickly replaced the boot on her other foot as well. Then he turned to the man in the stall and held out Jell's old boots and the three little gems. I want four, the man said flatly. Lucas gaped. You nearly tripped over yourself for the one. You can't possibly want more. But the man nodded, his jowls flopping as he moved his head. You heard me. I want four. That was one of my best pairs. Three is what I have. Lucas glared at the man. And if you don't take it, I guess I'll just have to take them somewhere else. Lucas. Lucas turned to see a man trying to drag Jell toward the outskirts of the market. A second man was facing Gerhard, who was begging for him to let her go. Lucas's heart sank when he recognized the circular scar on the first man's cheek. He'd been one of those to chase Lucas's little party out of town at the city gate. All that running, and they'd still been followed. Please. Gerhard cried. She's taken. Her betrothed is here. Another word from you, the large man growled, and I'll take your girl while I'm at it. Lucas abandoned the diamonds and ran after Jell. Get the women out of here. He called over his shoulder to Gerhard as he chased the man. Lucas had hoped not to draw his sword while in Terra Phantom. Not that he doubted his skills, as he'd been trained by King Everard himself. But fighting alongside his men or even against a single worthy opponent, such as his brother, was one thing. Fighting invisible foes alone in enemy territory was another matter entirely, especially with Jell's life hanging in the balance. Sure enough, the moment he jumped the broken fence, something hard slammed into his temple. Then his stomach. Then his knee. Lucas did his best to fight back, but fighting one invisible opponent was nearly impossible, much less two. What concerned him even more than his pain, however, was that Jell hadn't put a diamond in the man's clothing. What had he done to her to keep her from helping the way she had in the past? Then he spotted her body in the grass only a few feet away. She wasn't moving. Lucas looked around desperately for some of the diamonds Jell must have loosed with her shriek. Several kicks to the ribs later, he found them and threw them into the air. It wasn't a good toss, but he thanked the maker when one of the men reappeared. Lucas grabbed the visible man's ankle and twisted it, sending him sprawling. Then he rolled over, anticipating the second man's kick. His intuition was rewarded as the second opponent reappeared as he fell. But when he looked up to find Jell, she was gone. A desperate search revealed that she'd been thrown upon a mule and was being led by an invisible leader toward the eastern wood's edge. Anger made Lucas shake nearly as much as his pain did as he grabbed an arrow from his quiver and fitted it in his bow. He took aim at the mule as it entered the forest. His first mark missed. Before he could lose his second, a sweep to his legs knocked him flat on his back, and his vision spun. Chapter 23 Right Attached If Jell had doubted her trust for Lucas earlier, that doubt was long gone as her new captor pulled her at a quick pace through the fields. Where she had jerked away from the young prince before, now she would do just about anything to have him holding her instead of this stranger. She did her best to look for any weakness to exploit. At first she tried spooking the animal she rode so he would run away. But the man just pulled her off the beast's back with a cheerful admonishment and dragged her along beside him. Won't do you much good, love? he said in a sing-song voice as they left the main path and turned onto an older one that led into the forest, the road itself nearly overgrown with weeds. My youngest son needs a girl, and you'll do right fine. So just rest your bonny self so you're able to eat supper when we stop. He paused, and his smile widened. Daft lucky it was that those two big, UNS weren't right able to keep you for themselves. Now you won't have to go with the likes of them, and my son'll have a wife. Jell only redoubled her efforts when he said this. All her life, she'd been afraid of being taken. And now it had happened. Just when she'd been on the cusp of keeping up her side of the bargain and gaining her freedom for life, 
along with the chance to help Selena, she'd allowed herself to get sloppy. One moment, she'd been wondering at the way Lucas's warm fingers felt on her calves as he'd helped her with her boots. The next, she'd been dragged away in the thick of the crowd. And now this was it. She was going to live out the rest of her miserable days in this colorless, ugly world. Every ridiculous hope she'd recently dreamed up for herself about finding a life of her own one day would be dashed. And Selena's fate would most likely be worse. For as many dangers presented themselves to unclaimed maidens, the people of Terra Phantom were far less friendly to anyone touched by Tystal magic. She trembled as she bounced along behind her captor, his powerful steps dragging her no matter how hard she dug her heels in. But even resisting in such a small way eventually was too much. An hour after he'd taken her, she simply let him drag her until they came to a small campsite in the woods. Several logs had already been dragged over to the fire pit, and a few odds and ends, such as pots and pans and a roll of cloth hung from a dead tree. Sitting close to the ashes were a three-horned goat and a duck. Make yourself comfortable, he said, waving at one of the logs. Only, before yous go trying to run out on me, know that Lit Pit here is a good runner, and he'll have you on your face before you can get ten yards out. The man chuckled to himself as he ran a hand over his graying mustache. Best for your backside's sake if you just stays here and does as you're told. He started a little fire in the pit. My last two wives thought they'd make haste while I was sleeping, but Thais didn't know Lit Pit here was so quick. Figured I might as well tell you about him before you put him to the test. Last two wives? How many wives had the man had? And where were they now? Jell settled herself on the log farthest from the man and hugged her middle as the goat gave her a sneer. But she wasn't so frightened she couldn't stick her tongue back out at him. If only he could see it. Now that we're all settled like, the man said, putting a few strips of meat on one of the pans and holding it over the fire, tell old Jake a bit about yourself. Jell only glared at him. I see, Jake said after a long stretch of silence. Well, he reached down to adjust his meat strips, seeing as I got plans for you, it's fine with me if you're a mute. And if your face is covered. He leaned forward, his blue eyes so light they were nearly opaque. You'll be my son's problem tomorrow. He pointed east. Left him back that ways to tend the animals. Got a lot of bad stuff up our ways, we do. It's why Lit Pet here has three horns. Spent too much time out at the back pool at the edge of our property and drank from it every day. He shrugged and sniffed, her lack of response obviously posing no threat to his conversation. We thinks about moving every so often, but we gots the house and farm. Been in our family for three generations. Can't think of where we'd go if we left it. Jell stared at him. Was he mad? Not only had this man not committed a crime, at least, not one that had exiled him, but neither had his father. In fact, his own son was still with him. And they lived near a poisoned water source. Who in his right mind would stay when he was four generations removed from the original exiled member? But then, as she watched him dig into the hunk of meat he'd pulled from his pack, not bothering with any sort of social or personal etiquette, she realized there wasn't much about this man to suggest he was in his right mind at all. My son can deal with your mask. He looked at her out of the corner of his eye as he chewed on the skin of the meat. He has a right temper, mind you. Had a wife before, but she wasn't hardy enough. Died after only giving him three babes. Now, I'm a right soft old chap, but he's got a bit more of his mother in him. Best do as you're told and you'll learn to be content soon enough. Jell felt as though she'd been frozen to her seat. It wasn't bad enough that an old, stinking brute had yanked her away from the life she'd been living. No, now she was going to be expected to be a wife to his son and a mother to three of his grandchildren on a poison farm. And hope to avoid his anger while she was at it. A little part of her heart seemed to shrivel up and die as she glanced angrily up toward the sky and the god Lucas and the holy man liked to speak of. What good God allowed this? The man stood up and came to sit beside her. Jell was tempted to flee, but she saw Lit Pit giving her another mean look. What would she do if this man touched her? Her heart pounded heavily as the distinct sense of onion and body odor wafted toward her. 
Could she really stand to live like this? No. No, she would rather die. But instead of caressing her face or giving her some other unwanted amorous gesture, the man pinched her on the arm. She let out a little cry at the pain. There you are. I just wanted to make sure you had a... Before she could process the odd behavior, his eyes went wide as several diamonds tumbled down into her lap. Well, he finally said in a soft voice, picking up one of the jewels. It appears we might not need that drafty old house after all. He stared at the jewel for a long time, but eventually, he turned his eyes back toward her. And on his face grew the meanest smile she'd ever seen on a man. I'm so glad we crossed paths. He reached up and touched her face. But somehow, the same closeness she'd delighted in with Lucas the night before now held the tension of a rattlesnake as it coiled to strike. I think the whole family will be right attached to you. He began to lean in, but before he could reach her, he leapt up. Who's there? Two knives were suddenly in his hands as he searched the forest, which was fast becoming dark. Something whizzed through the air, and the man cried out as one of his knives was knocked from his hand with a clank. A second later, the other knife followed. And when she heard the voice that called back, Jell felt as though the maker himself had kissed her ears. Let the girl go, and I'll do the same with you. Lucas appeared as he neared them, bow in his hands and a third arrow knocked. The one that speaks diamonds? The man chortled. I think I'll be keeping her. He reached back. Lit pet, attack. The goat charged Lucas, who swung his bow down toward the animal. Lucas. Jell screamed his name as the man reached under the log and pulled out a crossbow. But as he raised it, an arrow stuck fast in his heart. He slumped to the ground, nearly knocking Jell over as he fell. Jell stumbled backwards to find Lucas at her side. On his face was a look of seething hatred, one she hadn't seen on him before, and it sent chills down her spine, though for what reason, she couldn't say. Are you all right? Lucas asked, not moving his eyes from the man as he rolled him over with his foot. Sure enough, the man's eyes were blank, and he'd ceased to breathe. Jell's voice fled her as she stared at the body, and she began to tremble. At first, it was simply a little shudder. But soon she was shaking so hard that her breath moved in and out too fast, and the world seemed like it was slightly tilted to the side. Only when Lucas had sat her down and gathered her in his arms was she able to make a sound. Wretched sobs racked her body as she leaned into him. Gone were her worries about his intentions or the way he might read her actions. She was too tired to fight anymore. She needed someone to lean on. He smoothed her hair with his hand over and over again, talking to her in low, gentle tones as he rubbed small circles on her back. She couldn't hear what he was saying through her crying, but she clung to his shirt even harder and buried her face in it. She would probably regret it later. They both might. But for now, she needed him. I thought you wouldn't come, she gasped between tears. And when he said he was giving me to his son. What did he do? Lucas pulled back from her, much to her chagrin. His face was hard, and she could feel his body tense, even as he studied her. Once again, she was reminded that this man could indeed be dangerous. But this time, she didn't mind. Jell, his voice was like a stone. Did he hurt you? She licked her dry lips and shook her head. No. I mean, not yet. It's more, what he had planned for me. She told him of the man's plans for her. As she spoke, she could feel his grip on her titan. And against her better judgment, for one long moment, she wished she could stay in his embrace forever. Eventually, they lapsed into silence. He stopped rubbing her back, but he didn't push her away, and she drank in the way it felt to be close to someone. The only person she'd been close to after her father's death had been Selena. But, she now admitted to herself, even her big sister's hugs had never comforted her like this. In Lucas's arms, she could close her eyes and let him watch over her and the horizon. For once, she didn't have to be strong. Selena had always sworn nothing like this existed. It was too good to be true. And yet, she was beginning to find doubts even in her sister's earnest warnings. 
I hate to say this, he finally said in a low voice, but we need to get going. Without moving, Jell opened her eyes to glance at the forest around them. This forest was far thicker than that which they'd traveled through with his mother. With an inward sigh, she stood, too. She stopped, though, when she heard a noise from the other side of the campfire. What about him? She pointed at the mule which was tied to a tree. But as she spoke, the beast snorted and laid its ears back, pawing at the ground. Probably better to leave him be, Lucas said. I really don't want to do any more chasing tonight if I can help it. Jell nodded and let him turn her in the right direction. Then a new thought hit her, and with it, guilt. Where's your mother? she asked. If he'd left her in the town to track down Jell, Dina wouldn't have lasted an hour on her own. She's still with Gerhard and his family. Gerhard was taking all the women back out to the western woods last I saw. He turned to go, but first, he held out his hand. Jell accepted it gladly. I'm sorry you had to leave her to find me, she said as he lifted a small lantern from the man's belongings. After lighting it, they headed back out into the woods. She would feel terribly guilty if something happened to Dina, frustrating as the woman could be. If there was any woman least suited to life in Terra Phantom, it was her. While I won't deny that I'll be much happier when she's with us again, I do think the maker sent us Gerhard's family for a reason, Lucas said. If I had to leave her with someone, I'm at least grateful it was with the kind of family that's least likely to do something dastardly. He glanced back at her. You know, not everyone in this world is out to get us. Still, Jell mumbled as they stepped carefully over a brook, if something happened to her, it would be my fault. Lucas whirled around and gave her a fierce look. Now see here, Jell. His voice was rough, and the fire in his eyes took her by surprise. I'll have none of that now. You keep thinking I'm going to either leave you or use you for my own devices. But know that for some reason, the Maker has put you in my trust. And as long as I'm breathing, I'm not about to let something happen to you. Or my mother. Understand? But why? Jell stopped walking. Why what? I just, I need to know why you're so intent on doing what's right when nearly every man I've ever known does what he wants instead. Surely that would be easier for you. His hazel eyes seemed to search hers for a long time, though she knew he couldn't see them. When he spoke again, his voice was surprisingly gentle. It would be easier. But maybe that's not the purpose. Jell thought hard on these words for the rest of their walk. An hour and a half later, they made it to Gerhard's little camp, which he'd made just at the edge of the eastern woods. Thought you could use a slightly shorter walk, he said when Lucas and Jell stumbled upon them. Lucas thanked him deeply before giving Jell something to eat and then sending her to bed. His instructions usually would have annoyed her to no end, except now all she wanted to do was sleep and dream of how she'd felt when he'd held her in his arms. Chapter 24 Norio Morning came far too soon. Jell couldn't remember her dreams when Frida woke her, but she did have the delicious sensation of knowing they'd been good. She couldn't remember the last time she'd slept so well, either. Where are you headed? Gerhard asked as they all shared bread and fruit from Ingrid's basket. North, Lucas said, sending Jell a quick look. Then west. The capital. Gerhard didn't bother to hide his surprise or his dismay. He looked back at Jell and Dina. Surely not with them. I'm afraid we have to, Lucas said grimly. It's a delicate matter. I see. Gerhard rubbed his neck then ran a hand through his straw-colored hair. I don't mean to pry, he said slowly. But I can't help getting the feeling that you all, he pointed to their little group, aren't exactly here like the rest of us. Jell's heart beat a little faster, but Lucas was smooth, as always, as he gave a little laugh. We're definitely not your average travelers, though I'm rather sure I can credit most of that to my mother. Gerhard looked at Dina for a long moment before throwing his head back in laughter. Dina looked slightly affronted, but she said nothing, thankfully, and the subject was dropped until they were all packed up and ready to say their final goodbyes. I can see I can't dissuade you from your destination. Gerhard said to Lucas. 
but at least take heed when I warn you that the Tystal troops are moving again. Yes, Ingrid said, taking her husband's arm. This was our last trip into town until they leave. She shivered. Some aren't as bad as others. But words come recently that they've been pillaging something worse than usual. Burned three towns to the ground recently, and slaughtered nearly all the men along with them. She jerked her chin toward the north. I hear they're headed to Norio. Jell's feet became rooted to the ground, but Lucas didn't seem to notice. You'll want to make sure you're sheltered every night once you pass the beach, Gerhard added, no sign of a smile on his face. Don't want to be caught out alone if they pass by. Lucas studied the Fisher family for a long moment before taking a deep breath. I, I can't tell you what the nature of our journey is, he said softly, giving Jell a meaningful glance. But I can tell you that you've done my family a great service. Perhaps, would there be a way for me to find you again? Say, after this infernal trek is over? I would like to repay you somehow if we survive all this. Gerhard and Ingrid shared a long look, but before either of them answered, Frida spoke from her perch on the horse. You can find us north of town. She pointed at a small field nearby. When Lucas looked confused, she only smiled. Papa likes to go south first so few guess where we're from. Gerhard laughed. Well, there you go, I suppose. We've got a garden behind the house and a barn so ugly it hardly deserves the name. They parted ways after that, and Jell, despite her natural suspicions, found herself wishing otherwise. It would have been nice to have the others with them, if not for Gerhard's easy laugh and Ingrid's corn cakes, to let Lucas have another man to share watch with so he didn't always look so tired. They had five days left in their walk, if everything went as planned, thanks to Dina's new mule. They would pass within viewing distance of the ocean as they moved north around the thickest part of the forest, then they would head east. A knot began to tighten in Jell's stomach, though, as they began to pass through potato fields, and she realized just how far north they'd already come. Have you ever seen the tie still? What? Jell was roused from her musings to find Lucas looking at her expectantly. His dark curls were still ruffled slightly from sleep, and he was walking with a bounce in his step that she hadn't seen before. Have you seen Ty still? I have. Her hand went to the leather medallion she kept tucked in her belt. But I'd prefer not to repeat the experience. Are they as fierce as everyone makes them out to be? Oh, they are. I mean, the ones I met were kinder to me, because of aid my father used to give them. But that was only one troop. She shivered as she recalled what that same troop had done to their town. Do you think we'll meet with some on the way? Unfortunately, Jell said, kicking a rock out of her way, if they're going to Norio, we're headed right for them. Lucas stopped, Dina's mule coming to a halt beside him. You're sure? Yes. Jell took a deep breath. Because Norio is my home. Dina, who had been rather sullen all morning, sniffed. I could have told you that, son, if you'd bothered to ask me. Lucas ignored her. You mean, we're going through your old village? Jell nodded. He looked around, but there was nothing for miles but potato fields. Surely, there has to be another road. No, Jell took a deep breath and began walking again. The only road that leads to the castle in these parts passes through Norio. And Gerhard was right. We'll want to find shelter. Only, she frowned, remembering again what the inn had looked like the last time the Tystel had come, blackened and smoking. We won't want to stay in the village itself. Why not? Lucas asked. They have a particular fondness for burning Norio to its foundations each time they visit. Lucas shook his head and muttered something beneath his breath. Where do you suggest we stay then? he asked. Before she answered, Jell weighed the risks. True, she had the medallion. And she hadn't doubted the Seth's good intentions in giving it to her. But she highly doubted most Heistel troops would stop to listen to her or even give her time to pull out such a gift and show it to them. Most were known for the speed at which they killed and destroyed. Gambling with their likelihood to listen wasn't something Jell was in the mood to try. And the fields were out of the questions, too. 
travelers had horror stories of what the Tystil had done to the men in their camps when they were discovered out in the open. So she squeezed her eyes shut and sighed. I know a place where we can go. The Tystil won't touch us there. She opened her eyes and tried to focus on the path. But you'll have to do exactly as I say. I understand that, Lucas said, giving her a slight frown. But I want to know what you're talking about first. Jell fingered the medallion again. We'll be staying with my stepmother. Lucas gaped at her for a long moment before shaking his head. Absolutely not. We have no choice. If we stay in the town, they're likely to torch our beds in the middle of the night. But they leave my father's land alone because of the healing services he gave them back when he was alive. But she was cruel to you. Lucas was glaring at her. And you know she'll be no different the moment we step through her door. Probably even more than she was before you left. Not if we buy her off. Jell loosened the scarf she'd donned again that morning and dumped the gems inside. We can tell her that you've come with the bride price. Lucas frowned. Is that even a real tradition here? No. But she's greedy enough I think she'll accept it without asking too many questions. We'll all go to bed early, and then we'll leave at dawn the next morning. She nodded, as if to convince herself. It would work. It had to. Then it dawned on her, and she felt herself growing excited. We can also find my sister and bring her with us. Jell clapped with joy as her greatest fears seemed to slide off her shoulders. And when we're done, we can go straight to King Everard instead of coming back to find her. It was perfect. Maybe the Maker did care about them after all. He scratched his head. I don't know. Lucas, there is no other way. If you want to get to the king, we'll have to pass through Norio. It's as simple as that. We might as well get her now rather than having to come back to find her when we're done. When he didn't answer, she turned to find him staring at her. What? Nothing. He gave her a slight smile. You just keep taking me by surprise. Jell was suddenly glad he couldn't see her face, as her cheeks were burning pleasantly at his praise and she couldn't help being reminded again of the night before. Still, here in the daylight, the rush of emotions she'd been through seemed a bit ridiculous. She'd been so quick to let him hold her, and she'd even hungered for his embrace once it was gone. Those desires, strong as they had been, must have been merely emotions born of fear, she told herself. Anyone would want to be held after being kidnapped. Still, she couldn't deny that she had come to trust him and that she wanted to trust him. Was there, a little voice inside wondered, a sliver of possibility that her attachment might even go beyond trust? That maybe this sham of a betrothal might be more than a sham after all? A few hours later, which was far too much mulling time for Jell's taste, they crested a hill. All thoughts of worry and fear were cast away, and Jell's breath fled her as she made out the sparkle of waves in the distance. There was the ocean, stretching as far as the eye could see. Terra Phantom had very little of its own beach, only a few miles. And those miles, everyone knew, were guarded heavily by the other kingdoms, though she knew not how. Many desperate men had lost their lives in those waves. Even the children knew the stories of bodies washed up on the beach, their faces and limbs discolored and contorted in monstrous forms. She couldn't see any bodies from where they walked on the low bluffs now, though and she also found she couldn't imagine any. Not where everything looked beautiful and clean. See that? They'd stopped walking, and Lucas's breath was on her ear. She shivered slightly as she realized just how close he was. He'd taken her shoulder with his left hand and was pointing with his right out at the water. See what? she asked breathlessly. Out there. There are two ships on the horizon. They look like blue shadows from here. That one's the Spada and the other one is the Scudo. What are they doing? Jell squinted at the horizon, trying to make out more details than just the blue blobs in the distance. They're waiting for me. She turned. For you? But why? He grinned. I'm the admiral of my brother's entire navy. He pulled a leather thong from inside his shirt. 
hanging from it was a small but lovely swirled shell. When I'm done with this mission, I'm supposed to try to make it back to the gate and lose my disguise for the guards to let me through. But if I can't make it all the way there, I can throw this shell into the water. What will it do there? She frowned at the little shell in confusion. Many stories of power she'd heard from her father and the holy man, but none involving shells. A bemused smile played on his face as he held the shell out, watching her masked face once again. My brother's wife is the queen of the merfolk. Well, queen is understating her position. She's really the sea crown. Jell didn't know what any of that meant, but the idea of Lucas knowing a mermaid was fascinating, and her title sounded incredibly important. Anyhow, he said, looking back down at the shell, as soon as this shell touches the water, they'll hear the song of protection she's placed inside of it. Then they'll know to come get me and bring me out to my ships, so I can sail safely home. Jell turned to study him with new eyes. She'd known he was important to his kingdom. Such a mission could only warrant that, particularly when the man making it was the king's brother. But until now, she hadn't realized what kind of power the man beside her must truly wield. Lucas wasn't just some bothersome errand boy like she'd treated him as early in their trek. He was the king's chosen hand. An entire nation depended on him, and with good reason. For the first time, in the weak sunlight, she noticed some of the scars on his face. And without thinking, she reached up to touch them. You seem rather young to have so many scars, she whispered. Should I be worried? He grinned, though she thought she noted a slight hint of insecurity in his voice. Do they take away from my rugged good looks? She slapped his arm, then marveled at how relaxed and familiar she'd grown around him. You know they don't, or you wouldn't be so cavalier about it. If you two are done, Dina called from her mule, I'm ready to move on. Coming, mother, Lucas called back. And again, as they made their way back to his indignant mother, Jell marveled at how he made her feel like he could see her. How long had it been since she'd truly been seen? They never ventured to the beach, only walked close enough to see it. Doing so would have added hours to their walk. But Jell couldn't help staring hungrily at the foamy waves as they curled in on themselves and crashed against the shore for hours without fail. How had she lived this close to the beach all her life and never seen it? What do you want, Jell? Lucas called several hours later. Dina had fallen asleep on the mule, and after tying her carefully to her mount, they had continued. I'd like a piece of ham, Jell answered with a dry smile. And a big cup of mint lemonade. Lucas laughed. I mean if you were to pretend that your sister is safe and sound, and you weren't in Terra Phantom, what would you ask for in all the world? The first answer on Jell's tongue was you. But as that would be highly embarrassing for both of them, particularly considering his recent attempt at a betrothal, she thought instead for a long moment. A box of paints, she finally said. And a few brushes and canvases, too. Really? He widened his eyes and stared at the clouds for a moment, nodding slowly to himself. Then he turned back to her. Why? Jell stopped and began to search her bag. Lucas joined her mule still in hand. Eventually, she produced a frayed, slightly torn little picture. It had a sunset over the ocean and a ship moving into the fading orange and yellow light. It's beautiful, he said, studying it for a moment then handing it back. My mother painted this, she said, smiling down at the little picture before returning it carefully to her bag. She tried to teach me when I was young, but she died before I was old enough to learn much and my father refused to buy any more paints after that. Too expensive and hard to get, he said. She shook her head. He was probably right. But since then, I've always wanted to put the colors of the world on a canvas. She felt her smile fade as she looked again at the sea. Far out over the water, so far she wondered if she was imagining it, she saw what might be blue sky. Direct beams of sun must be hitting the water, though because the water glittered until Jell's eyes hurt from looking at it. But I've never had a canvas, she said, shaking her head and resuming their walk, and no colors to put on it, even if I did. That picture is the closest thing I've ever gotten to beauty. She swallowed hard. And it's foolish to want anything more. 
she tossed a handful of gems over the edge of the cliff. The closer they drew to Norio, the more she was reminded that she was living in a dream. This was merely a means to an end, for both of them. And it was ridiculous to expect anything else. She glanced at the snoring woman on the mule. Especially if it had been brought about by her. What do you mean? Jell looked at Lucas, who was giving her a funny stare. She picked up a small stick and used it to tap the road with each step. In this land, beauty is a commodity. It's bought and traded and stolen, but it doesn't bloom. She shook her head. Nothing blooms here. At least, not on its own. Nothing, he asked. She held out her arms to the brown and gray world around them. Do you see any beauty here? For a long moment, he didn't give her an answer, only studied her with a look so intense that it made her want to turn away. Then, to her surprise, he stopped again and came so close that his proximity threatened to buckle her knees and send her over the edge of the bluff they were standing on. I can't see details through the mask, he said hesitantly. But sometimes, sometimes I think I can make out the shape of your eyes. My eyes? she echoed. He nodded. They're shaped like almonds. And, he touched her jaw, I can tell your face is shaped like a heart. He smiled, and Jell couldn't have moved from the spot if she'd wanted to. Then he took a step back and gave her a funny tilt of his head. Sometimes you have to search for beauty. But that doesn't mean it's not there. He started to walk again, but the thoughtful expression didn't leave his face. The maker puts all sorts of beauty in the world, he said, pausing slightly as he stole a glance at her. And I think he put it here, too. They resumed their walk, but it was nearly an hour before anyone spoke again. Eventually, however, Lucas cleared his throat. When we're all done with this, how about I take you on a ship one day? I'd love that, Jell laughed, not believing what she was saying. He grinned. Just stick with me, and you'll get your sunset. I promise. Jell lapsed into silence. What was he saying? Did he really mean he wanted to see her one day, even after their business deal was concluded? Jell didn't know, but whatever his promise meant, it made her happy. Thank you for listening to A Curse of Gems, a clean fantasy fairy tale retelling of Toads and Diamonds, Part 3. To listen to Part 4, or to find more clean fairy tales, visit my channel for more free audiobooks. If you've enjoyed this free audiobook experience, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell so you're notified when new free fairy tales are uploaded. Visit BrittanyFictorFiction.com for more fairy tales in ebook, print, and audiobook format, and join my newsletter list, Brit's Bookish Mages, to get bonus stories about the characters, sneak peeks at works in progress, book coupons, and more. A Curse of Gems, a clean fantasy fairy tale retelling of Toads and Diamonds. Book Copyright 2019. Audio Copyright 2023. Brittany Fichter. All rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced, distributed or transmitted in any form or by any means without the prior written permission of the publisher. For permission requests, write to the publisher at brittanyfichterfiction.com.